with Q&A discussion, we'd like you to use the question area in the GoToWebinar control panel to type your questions in, and we will get to those during the presentation. Um, also want to let you know that this presentation is being recorded and will be posted online on mycugc.org. You will also get a link to the recording after the webinar, probably sometime tomorrow. With us today, we have several of our SIG leaders. We have Dan Schlemme, he is the leader of the Healthcare SIG, along with Dave Brett, Jason Samuel, and Karsten Bruns. Uh, they are some of the leaders of the networking SIG. And uh, with that, I am going to turn things over to Dan uh, Schlemme first to get us started with his portion of the webinar. Dan, I'll be sending you the screen right now. All right, Dan, are you there? Yes, I am. Oh, okay, <laughs> just making sure you weren't talking. And we hear you. <laughs> okay, um, so just start off with a little bit of information on uh, Novant here. So um, I'm at Novant Health, and as you can see from this lovely slide here, this great marketing slide that we have. Um, Basically, a nonprofit healthcare system. Uh, we're located in North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, and Georgia. Um, 24,000 employees, give or take. That kind of change is deba depending on, I guess, uh, which what we acquire, what we build. Um, we have 15 medical centers, 436 uh, physician clinics, 1380 physicians, uh, 2585 licensed beds, and that is our website. So uh, that's just one of the pictures of our mini. Uh, different types of hospitals that we have. So to start off with using the uh, net scalers in our environment, um, we back in the day had one set of net scalers doing very little, um, nothing, nothing too important. And as we started to grow, we started realizing that there was a much larger need for load balancing in our environment for many different reasons. Um, and these are basically some of the objectives that we looked for when trying to figure out which route to go, whether it be at the time uh, ACEs, A10s, uh, F5s, net scalers, so on and so forth. Um, we need to first identify the needs uh, in the environment for load balancing, which for us could involve um, Citrix, uh, it can involve our exchange, it involved our Dragon Dictation, it involved Epic, so on and so forth. So we needed to find something that would work for all of our different needs. Um, Something that could be uh, quickly uh, and uh, that could be scaled quickly and efficiently. Um, that was one thing that really drew us to the net scalers itself is that the the ability to grow fairly quickly. Uh, we actually ended up having to do that last year, and it actually went very smoothly for us. Um, we need redundancy between data centers. Um, for us, we were very lucky in the aspect of each of our data centers are geographically look, uh, close enough to each other that we did have dark fiber between them, so it is if we were sitting in one data center. Um, not everybody's going to have that, that benefit, and we'll talk about uh, a piece of that later um, in my GSLB uh, configuration. Um, the UI needs to be user-friendly um, at the time we were really just kind of starting off with diving into the use of uh, the net scalers. So we needed to make sure, and load balancing itself. So we really needed to make sure that no matter who looked at it, they could quickly, easily, and understand how we how we utilized it and, and how you want to build a VIP and whatnot. Um, as everybody knows here, especially recently in the last year or so, our security team is kind of um, skyrocketed with the number of uh, restrictions they're putting in on both our internal and our external connections. Um, so we needed to be able to make sure that we were going to be you know, HIPAA compliant and PCI, which PCI has really grown for us in the last, uh, last two or three years, I'd say. Um, we need to reduce the downtimes uh, uh, for failovers. So one of the things we were running into is that when we had uh, an environment that was not load balanced, as everybody knows, if you're looking at a DNS entry, if you need to change that DNS entry, you're looking at you know, maybe hours without touching um, the actual devices and doing a, a DNS cache flush, 
or you know or minutes depending if you touch them the problem is how many devices do you have to touch in order for that to happen uh, so we needed something that would allow us to have the sustainability and the, and the ability to stay up uh, at all times without having to worry about flushing uh, flushing cache DNS and, and any of that uh, we also need to monitor our traffic and, and our VIP status so we need to see you know what's going on in our environment and uh, um, what's going on in our environment and see if we can check the traffic going to it and to and from it and um, and to make sure that they're up so um, so basically here's what our, we use for our, our environment here um, our Citrix environment I think everybody on the call probably utilizes the net scalers um, for the basics of the, the Citrix environment the XML brokers will be controller storefront PVS director and net scaler gateway um, those are our primary go-to's for for getting everything up and running um, the next piece comes into our non Citrix in our EHR environment so it's a, this is the non Citrix EHR um, so what this is is Exchange uh, SMTP. Uh, this was a big one. As we began to grow, we used to uh, basically have a round robin of SMTP, and what that did was just in DNS. So what it did was just kind of go through those those names that are in in DNS. Unfortunately, if there was uh, an outage on one of the devices, you would still try to hit that particular DNS entry, and you would essentially get a failure. Um, We've, uh, we've since then put SMTP um, behind the load balancers, and we've had great success with that. Um, I will tell you that it is a bear to get um, to get configured. It involved working with Citrix and Microsoft both, um, and I've actually written a uh, a blog on uh, CUGC and I've posted, and that's the link there um, of exactly how we. Um, of, of how we built that out. Now that there is going to be for SMTP and SMTP relay. Um, so um, uh, and, and utilizing IIS. So those are two slightly different configs, but everything's out there, and it made life a lot easier once we finally got it uh, squared away. Uh, OWA, same thing. We had a simple uh, DNS entry, round robin, and long story short, if same thing with SMTP. If one DNS or one server was down, we ran into an issue where users could not connect. Um, we've also recently implemented ADFS, uh, VMware View, and our our medical device interfaces. Uh, ADFS and VMware View, um, those are those are pretty straightforward with the configurations. Um, medical device interfaces. We actually, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit later, um, but we are actually able to utilize a primary and a non-addressable uh, VIP, and that allows us to do failovers for our medical devices without having any downtime or you, or calling on any other teams uh, um, to change the DNS entry or to touch the devices themselves. Uh, so, so that's actually um, become very beneficial for us. Uh, EHR needs. Uh, we use Epic, so everything we have for Epic is is now 100% load balanced, and we use a GSLB configuration for all of these now. And the prod DB that you see at the end, that's set up identical to how we have our medical devices, along with ECP. Um, we'll talk about those more here in just a bit. <clears throat> so. This is how our NetScalers are configured. Um, and say in the last in the last six years, we've probably bought six or eight HA pairs of NetScalers. And what that is is due to the fact that we've grown so quickly and so exponentially. Um, each time we we bought a, a set of NetScalers, we spec them out for what we were building them for. Well, I think as everybody knows, once you get into it and you start working, you see that everything's working fine and everybody's pleased with the results, everybody wants to migrate. And since then, we've actually decommed our ACEs and A10s. So um, we actually have two HA pairs, uh, one pair per data center, and we have 11500s, 11540s. Those are just based off of uh, the models that are available when we purchased them. We did not purchase them together. Um, we have 40 gig uh, port channel, all active and it's split between switches. So what we essentially have is, uh, and we pretty much have the same configuration for external, and what we have is redundancy power-wise, uh, port-wise, and device-wise, uh, device hardware-wise. 
So that allows us to essentially not have any outages unless there is a pretty much a, a meteor or a man-made failure, unfortunately. Um, we do have active-active GSLB for both internal and external, and we do use uh, command center monitoring. And I'll talk about uh, why we use command center versus HDX Insight here in just a bit. Uh, for our external, the only real difference we have here is instead of having four uh, 10 gig ports together, we now have two 10 gig ports together, and that handles all of our DMZ connectivity. Um, we do have two 1 gig ports channeled together, and those again are our active active. Um, and what that's for is our community connect. For Epic, we basically have another aspect that another farm that it connects to in its own siloed uh, DMZ connectivity um, zone. So we just phys uh, physically separated the connections itself. Uh, we do have another configuration identical to that coming down the pipe sometime soon for our PCI environment, um, which, again, with the NetScalers, we're able to essentially run PCI scans and, and checks on NetScaler to ensure that we are uh, PCI compliant. Now, one of the big things that I mentioned was, uh, was storefront. And one thing that was great here as we moved to storefront is the uh, option for an optimal gateway. So as everyone knows in the old web interface days, and in, in fact, I believe with the with storefront itself now, when you make a connection uh, without making any of this configuration, by default, you're going to make a direct connection back to that backend uh, Zenapp server itself or, or controller or VDA, et cetera, um, which is great if you're internal. Internal is perfectly fine. But when you get to the point where you start having uh, VPN tunnels from site to site, uh, we actually utilize the NetScaler gateway internally and externally as well. And what this does is it allows all the traffic, all the ICA traffic to travel through the NetScaler. So now whenever we build a VPN tunnel, instead of opening up all the IPs for the back-end servers, we're just opening up the, the two IPs that we have built for the NetScaler gateway. And we have two because we are in an active, active configuration for GSLB. And all that's going to mean is that when you're connecting, you're going to have an option to choose between one, one IP or the other. Now, you don't choose that. Obviously, it picks it for you, and that's which data center you're at. Um, before 3.5, <clears throat> excuse me, for storefront, you would actually have to make a configuration change in the web config file. And everything in red here is what you would what you would change. Uh, you would add in that information, um, and that would force it to use what's called optimal gateway. And that's essentially saying storefront, send all information, all traffic through the NetScaler itself. Um, after 3.5, it's actually in the GUI itself. Um, and I don't have a, a, a screenshot of that. I apologize. Um, but it's, it's actually in the GUI itself, which makes this uh, available. Now, if you utilize HDX Insight, you'll be able to monitor all that traffic, ICA and, and whatnot, going through the NetScaler itself, which this makes it a lot easier to, to maintain traffic um, and monitor it. I will say this does give you a, a point of failure if the NetScaler does go down, obviously, and you do not have a proper HA backup or a GSLB config. You, you will have, um, you know, your connections will drop and you will, you know, your users will not be able to connect. So our key EHR configurations. So one thing I was talking about earlier, and this is this is for Epic, but this can be used for any myriad of, of configurations. Our previous config was we had two VIPs, uh, essentially one per data center. And every time we had an outage or we had a flip of, um, of our prod database, which we look at like an epic PRD as our DNS entry, um, it would look at one specific IP as an A record. Well, when we made the flip uh, as part of our quarterly failovers or whatnot, we would actually have to change that and then touch each one of our Epic Citrix servers along with all of our backend Epic servers themselves. Um, for us, with the size that we are, um, at the time we had physical, so that was almost 200 physical servers that we, that we needed to touch just for uh, Citrix itself. And we had all the other components that needed to be touched as well. Um, now we have about 800 servers, so obviously that's not really feasible to go through and, and do that. Um, or we could 
change the TTL, but that's a lot of manual labor on the back end to do leading up to that time. Um, you had to involve multiple teams. We had um, all the different teams involved, from Netscaler to our DNS team to AD to Epic, all involved with this. Um, the new configuration is with our active active GSLB configuration. Um, we actually have one C name, uh, and that is actually pointing um, pointing to both the IPs uh, in each data center. And we actually have it set up with a active and uh, failover IP. And basically what that's meaning is all of our servers at one specific site are turned off. And um, when we're connecting, we're just connecting to the servers that are up. If we take all the servers uh, down in the primary VIP itself and bring up the failover, all our communication continues to flow to the servers that we just brought up. Um, what this basically does is eliminates, uh, eliminates the need to involve all the other teams. If there is an emergency need for a failover, such as a fire or power outage or whatnot, our database team can actually make, manage the failover seamlessly without involving anybody. Uh, we've actually do this with our medical interfaces quite often, and it, it has been a godsend to them. Uh, this whole configuration here has allowed them to to be able to fail over back and forth without any issues at all. Um, with the active active GSLB, if we lose connection to one particular data center, users are still going to continue to work because they'll continue to hit the se the other active data center and get get their connections as needed. <clears throat> now, this is just kind of a example of of what we have built up here. And it's an, I know it's a little hard to see, so I'm going to try to zoom in here and see if I can get all this. Hopefully that zoomed in for you guys. Um, what we see here is basically our, our prod ECP load balancing virtual server. And what we have here is we've got the IP and then we've got um, the ports and the service groups assigned here. Well, if you see down here, we have a backup virtual server, and uh, we have this set for stateful. So what this does is between the two HA pairs, this is going to send the TCP traffic back and forth with each other. And what this does is basically allow, if we do have a manual failover in that data center itself, the traffic connecting, a user connecting on, say, session one, if that, data, if that Netscaler fails over, that information is passed over to the HA pair. Therefore, that user is going to be reconnected to the HA pair that just failed over, and it's going to see that it also had session one. This is very important for from the Epic side of the house. Uh, we had a lot of locked records if we ever had a failover for whatever reason. Um, there was a time where we had some network connectivity between our two data centers, and we had a number of failovers, which resulted in thousands of locked records. Um, setting this to stateful uh, actually resolved that issue 100%. We no longer needed to worry about um, ab about any of that uh, locked records. So this backup here is actually a non-addressable site itself, and I'll show you an example of that. Hopefully that's zooming in for you guys. And all this is is it's the same protocol. And what you're seeing here is the state here is actually down. And it's down because in these service groups, all of our servers are actually down as far as our service that I'm monitoring is concerned. And what this will do is once we turn these up, if we turn all these up right now, traffic is still going to go to the primary servers in the VIP itself. This here um, basically allows us a failover. And we have this down because of the way Epic works. Both cannot be up at the same time. but if we turn these up and turn down the uh, the primary, it gets uh, all the traffic gets routed to this backup. And so far, that's been very successful. We actually have a failover this weekend. Um, and this was, um, I don't know if anybody was at the Epic XGM, but this was actually something that uh, Novant itself, our uh, database admins, our Unix admins actually spoke about. So, um, so, so far, it's it's worked out pretty well for us. And we have a, a pretty major failover this weekend. Uh, and hopefully it continues to, to work well for us. Um, as far as the active-active 
configuration is concerned, I want to share some pros and cons with the configuration itself. Now, I spoke of active-active configuration for GSLB. Um, that's not the only type of configuration. You can have an active-passive as well, and each are perfectly fine. It's going to be 100% dependent on your environment and what you would like to do. Um, Active passive, I believe, is more geared towards if you have a geographical location that's much further apart. Um, you, you would want to do that active active in that scenario um, with latency too high would not be the way to go. Um, so some of the pros that we had here is we had redundancy between data centers. Um, uh, you know, as I've as I've harped on, um, as we all know. Uh, downtime is really not acceptable in the healthcare environment. We are 24-7, and unfortunately, that's something that we, we have to live with. It's come to norm to most of us, but for, you know, for some people, it's, it's kind of hard to get their head around. But the redundancy between data centers is, is wonderful. Um, you never have to worry about a data center down. Oh, nobody can connect. Um, we have uh, less load per net scalers. So as I talked about earlier, we we kept growing and growing and growing, so we kept buying new and new and new and bigger and better. Um, this this redu reduces the load, and the way we're configured, we, our load is essentially split 50-50 between each NetScaler, um, each NetScaler HA pair, I should say. Um, that's working great. It gives us plenty of, of, of room in the event that we um, lose one particular data center. We still have the uh, horsepower at the secondary data center to still carry a full load. And that's how we've scaled it out. Um, we haven't had that run it happen so far, knock on wood, but just it's always good to have that ability. Um, we can manage our connections due to maintenance. So we've already had to uh, perform maintenance on the core switching at each of our data centers. And what was nice is in the GSOB config, I was actually able to disable connections to the data center. So prevent all connections going to the data center that they would be working on. And what that does is it just just a fail safe. So in the event that they do take down a port or or the whole switch itself or the router, um, no users are going to be affected by this. So um, this is this is something that's been very beneficial to us so far. Um, and that leads into the, the next point. There is zero down uh, zero downtime for firmware upgrades. Since we are active active, we can perform upgrades. And when we perform these upgrades. We can just do the same thing, cut connection to one data center or the other, perform the upgrade, and turn those back on and disable connections to the other data center. Um, that That's a godsend to us because before, I, don't, I know everybody's done an upgrade at some point, the steps you have to go through to make sure you don't have accidental failovers is, is pretty significant. So. Um, and at the end there, less user uh, less users affected by data center outage. So um, the cons on this, um, I was actually a little surprised by this, but one of the issues that we ran into um, is the lack of knowledge from Citrix as a whole. It seems that everybody has a firm understanding of how to initially get it configured, but once you start getting into specific app type questions, um, and questions as far as uh, persistence and um, configuration, there seems to be a uh, few people that really know it inside and out. Um, so that's just one thing I, I will say. Um, you will find your answer. You just have to dig and kind of have to escalate it. Just keep escalating to get to a, a, an issue or get a resolution, I should say. Um, that was one thing that surprised me, but uh, what we have been able to resolve all of our issues so far. Um, uh, the potential latency due to physical distance. If again, as I said, if the distance is too far and the latency is too high, it's not going to be it's not going to be feasible to do it active active. That would be more of an active passive type configuration. Um, the persistency options are limited um, from the GSLB perspective itself, and and the persistence is really based off of the DNS that you're hitting. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind there. Um, I've mostly found that the DNS uh, persistence or the persistence itself from a GSLB is is kind of flaky at best, so we actually don't utilize it, um, which seems to be working just fine for us. And one issue that we have recently run into, uh, if anybody's going to O365, obviously you're going to want a uh, fully re redundant and resilient environment. 
one of the issues that we're running into right now is uh, incompatibilities with the use of a C name. So um, the GSLB configuration that we have now points to a C name uh, that points to basically our Netscalers as authoritative to, to resolve the DNS entry. Um, we're running into a major issue with that right now, um, and Microsoft is very quick to tell you um, you need to talk to Citrix. So we've actually had to uh, open up tickets and talk to the Citrix folks who supported their own O365 configuration. So um, just some heads up there with that particular config. Uh, everything seems to work okay. Uh, if it's not in GSLB except for um, an active free configuration, which is when you're, or active busy, I should say, which is when you're looking at people's calendars to see if they're um, free or, or busy. Um, but again, this is, we're, we're, you know, we've been at this for a little bit. We're slowly making steps. Once we get all this squared away, I'll do the same thing I did for SMTP and write it all up and I'll post it, post a blog for it. Um, but just some heads up on that particular uh, setup there. Um, now, monitoring. So I talked about some different types of, of monitoring earlier, HD, HDX and command center. So HDX is a really great tool, um, and it, it will literally tell you end-to-end -end where all the traffic is, what the latency is, what the round-trip time. I mean, it will tell you everything you need to know. Um, and it, it, is, it is a great, great tool, great visuals. We know all managers like graphs and whatnot. So. This is actually a, a really great tool for that. Um, and it can integrate with Director itself. So as you're looking at your Zen desktop, Zen app environment uh, with, with Director, you can pull that information into Director. Um, one of the big negatives to it, we actually implemented it, and it worked great uh, for about a day or two. Um, one of the issues that we ran into it is there, all, there seems to be a, an issue with AppFlow logging and um, session reliability. And what that basically did was it crashed our Netscalers. Now, if you don't have AppFlow or AppFlow logging or session reliability on, there really wasn't an issue from everything I, I've read and I understand it and I've talked with Citrix about. But AppFlow and session reliability was two things that one we have and one we wanted. So, um, that actually was not a way to go for us. I believe the issue is resolved now in the newer 11.1 builds with um, with the 11.1 uh, builds of uh, the firmware for the Netscaler and the newer version of HDX Insight itself. Um, and the guys speaking next would be able to tell you specifically more about that if, if you did have questions. But that was one of, one of the issues that we uh, that we ran into. Great tool, um, but it does have some bugs that. That, you know, we tried multiple versions, just really wasn't the way for us to go. We use Command Center, and for alerting purposes and monitoring, this is this is great. Um, we set up our monitors; it lets us know when things are up or down. Uh, it keeps me on top of my app owners when they're, you know, messing around, thinking they're being slick. Um, just lets me know what's going on. It actually helped us troubleshoot a an issue that we had in our DMZ uh, a few months ago, and it made us uh, made us pretty aware of it. Um, it is a little clunky. It's not the easiest to navigate and understand and pull data out of. Um, it's kind of, it, it's got a lot of detail that Insight does, but it's it's all text-based. It's, it's just not the best tool for pulling information. You can pull it, it just takes a little work to do it. Um, you can configure it for auto backups um, of the config itself. Uh, I think that by default it does it couple times a day, something along those lines, or maybe once a day. Um, and it's very detailed with the monitoring. The monitoring itself will tell you everything you need to know right then and there. So so we use Command Center. Insight is, is great um, just for us with the, the tendency to crash the Netscare for what we needed. We could not use it. Um, so that's pretty much everything that we're really using our environment for. Um, I did want to uh, bring up here that if you are going to Synergy, there's a couple events here that I'll be um, helping host, uh, the roundtables, uh, the 23rd and 24th, and then myself and Carl, who are the, uh, who's the other healthcare SIG uh, lead, we will be doing the healthcare roundtable on the 25th. So 
it'd be great to meet everybody who's been a part of the webinars and and whatnot uh, or if you have any questions or anything and then also the 25th there is a healthcare industry forum and networking reception from 3:30 to 5:30, which I will be at it as well I believe Carl is um, as well but uh, I'm not 100% certain, but just wanted to bring those up to everybody, um, that those are some events that I'll be at um, if you'd like to meet and chat. And then, any questions? So Dave and Jason, do you see any questions out there that would be um, good to go over? I know some of them got answered in the chat, but maybe some of them other people might want to know about. Yeah, we see a few questions on Netscale or Mass, uh, but I th I we'll be covering Mass a little bit more in depth uh, shortly here, so I think that's going to answer some of these questions. Yeah, I didn't mention that because I knew you guys were going to be talking about that. There was a question on here about the um, the data for your application, but I can't struggling to find it. I'm pretty sure it's with with the fact that your um, Netscalers are active. Active is the data live in both your both your data centers. What was the question again? I'm sorry. I think with the um, with the net scalers being active, active is the data for your app live in both data centers. Uh, that would depend on the application itself. Um, for Epic, it, uh, they do a mirroring, and that happens every handful of minutes. That will sync the data to both the databases in each data center. Uh, and some applications simply have a a LUN that is replicated or does physically get migrated uh, because it's virtual from data center to data center in the event of an outage. Awesome. Yeah, I've found that was from David uh, Hoover, I think his name is. Hopefully that answers that for him. I see a question here from Matt. Uh, generally, what's the benefit of using a pair in each location if you're fully site redundant? So what we wanted to make sure is that users that were connected, if you have that quick HA, quick HA in one data center, you don't actually have a full drop of connection if you if we lose uh, just that one appliance. If we, in the, in the past, when we've gone and done a failover between data center to data center, uh, we have had some, uh, some outages and issues reconnecting because of the switch from uh, one HA pair to the other. So, and the other piece of that was we did want to make sure that in the event that we do lose a data center, we are fully redundant at the second data center. So if that third appliance decides to crash for whatever reason, we do still have the redundancy there. Um, that was basically a more of a super redundant recover our butts um, scenario. Okay, we got a few more questions here. Uh, there's an option to enable session reliability on Netscaler HA pair failover situations. Uh, the drawback is that it will consume increased bandwidth consumption. Do you have this enabled in your setup? We do not have that enabled right now. Okay, uh, I've got another question here from Kevin. Uh, is HA still the way to go, or is clustering a better choice uh, instead of active passive HA? Uh, on two lower spec appliances, go with two or three uh, or single higher spec appliances. So either go with two or go with uh, two or three or single. I can't make that out. It's kind of running together there on my screen. I, I mean, personally, I would say an HA would, would be the way to go. Uh, that way you know everything's synchronized and configured uh, the same. Um, that's just from my experience. I've, I've personally, I mean, I haven't worked with the clustering. Uh, I've kind of read about it, but I, all my experience has been with the HA itself. Uh, Dave, you guys might be able to answer a little bit better than I can. Got some comments here from uh, Ozzy around 
inside being unstable um, and that flow causing some issues. There's hoping that uh, the 12.x builds will stabilize that. And uh, got another one. Any idea on ICA bandwidth consumption for a single ICA session? Whatever open ended question. <laughs> what was that again? Any it's idea on ICA bandwidth consumption for a single ICA session? It's not, probably not something you can answer. It depends on right. going through that channel, right? Yeah, it's going to be based off of every, I mean, yeah, it's going to be completely based off that individual session. All right, I think that's uh, all the questions that have come in so far. Okay. And if anybody has any more questions, you know, we can talk after or always uh, send me a chat on the um, healthcare SIG. I'll be happy to answer. And I've put links to the networking and healthcare SIGs in the chat window, and then you'll also get a link to the forum thread for this webinar, and you'll be able to ask more questions there. Um, so with that, Dave, are you ready for me to uh, switch over the screen to you? Yep, go for it. All right. You see that, right? Yes, I can. Jason, you on? Yeah. Cool. Um, so <clears throat> we were thinking about what to what to do on this uh, section of the the sort of joint webinar, and we figured with uh, twelve dot o just coming out, we'd run through some of the features for Netscaler and NMAS. 12.0. Um, we, we do have quite a few slides, so we'll probably be moving quite quickly through the content. Um, if there are any questions, then just chuck them in the, in the chat window or the questions window, and um, Carson's around. He's going to do his best to field as many of the questions as he can uh, while we're presenting. If he doesn't get around to doing all of it um, straight away, then we'll, um, we'll put a blog post out as we normally do on the, on the SIG and try and answer everything we can. Going to go through some intros, um, then run through Netscaler 12.0 and the features and some of the features that stood out for us. Then move on to MAS, same version, and then um, go through some of the known issues and workarounds that we've picked up along the way with some of the testing, and then run through some of the um, sessions that are going on at Synergy with a with a networking background. So my name is Dave Brer. I'm based in Liphook in the UK. Um, I'm recently a Citrix CTP, uh, uh, my CUGC networking SIG leader with Jason and Marius and Carsten, and also a community contributor on um, Doug's DABCC.com site. I've been working with Netscaler since 2007. Uh, there's a link up there to a blog that I run, and you can find me on Twitter using at dbretton. And my name is Jason Samuel. I'm from Houston, Texas. I am a CTP and ACE uh, networking SIG leader, um, one of the leaders of the Houston user group, and I also contribute on DABCC. I've been working with Netscaler since 2006. Uh, my website information is to the right, and my uh, Twitter handle is also there on the right side. Yeah, hi. My name is uh, Carsten. I'm from Germany. I'm a CDA and also networking SIG leader. I'm working with uh, Netscaler since 2011. My contact details are on the right. So moving uh, on to Netscaler 12.0. Um, it was released on the 25th of April this year. Um, the Release notes say it's got 101 new features and 61 known issues with the current release. Um, 
a couple of things that we've seen initially straight off the bat. It's got a, a new, improved, kind of more compressed user interface with a, a bit less white space than that. Um, in the UI, Jason's going to run through a few bits on that later. It does seem a little bit snappier than the 11.1. One. It's um, a bit faster to navigate around whilst not all functions are that intuitive. For the most part, it's fairly good. Um, it does come with a new release of NMAS 12, that same version. Um, during this bit of the, the presentation, we're just going to run through some of the standout features that we've picked up. Okay, so uh, let's get into the GUI changes first. Um, on the left-hand side, I have a 12.0 Netscaler VPX, and on the right-hand side, I have an 11.1. Uh, the first thing you'll notice is in the top left-hand side uh, of both screens is that the Citrix logo no longer appears in 12.0. Um, in 11.1, it was a PNG file. Um, in in 12.0, it was removed, and they're actually using the Citrix Sans font to actually display that now. Um, on the left-hand side, you'll see that the navigation, a lot of the white space has been removed. It's very compressed looking now. Um, some of the fonts, like for example, the title fonts like System, it's a little bit smaller now. And then the other big uh, indicator here uh, that everything's kind of compressed is that the bars along the top, and I put three little lines there to kind of demonstrate what I'm talking about. The dark blue is now a little bit more compressed, the brighter blue is a little bit compressed, and then the white space from uh, the title section to the next bar up is a little bit compressed as well. So it kind of moves everything uh, a little bit higher to the top. So when you're reading things, your eyes aren't really darting all over the place. It's all just in one location. Uh, next screen. Yep. Uh, the brighter colors for the up, down, and partial up status. So on the left-hand side, I have a 12-0 um, indicator, uh, um, indicator lights, actually. So you'll see that the green is very bright, the red is very bright, and the yellow is, is almost a hot orange compared to the right-hand side, which is the 11-1 with the lighter uh, shades. Um, you also will see that service groups actually matches the other nodes now. Previously, the service groups, for, for some reason, had that little half-moon shape from the older 11-0 um, and 10-5 days. But now everything is now this new brighter uh, red, uh, red, green, and yellow. This also kind of helps people uh, kind of see, um, like if you have, um, if you, if you had like uh, like red color blindness or anything like that, you had uh, issues seeing the colors. This actually now is a little bit brighter, so you'll actually see those shades uh, come up. And um, I know for a fact that in the SDX, uh, some of them didn't actually s uh, say up, down, or partial up. It would just show the lights only. They're actually going through and changing those screens as well. So um, that is a really big improvement. Next slide, please. And then um, on the actual login screen, uh, it no longer has a Citrix logo. So on the 12, 12 O's on the left, 11 ones on the right. Um, at first, I thought that this was intentional, and uh, I actually had to verify it with the product team because uh, I had a little bit of a mini heart attack. Uh, I was thinking, wait, you know, around Synergy time, they're always talking about acquisitions and stuff, and we recently heard that Cisco bought Vitella, so the networking landscape is changing. So I thought, wait, what's going on here? Uh, the reality is when you, when you debug it, it's actually doing a 404, when you, and it's actually trying to get that image. Um, it is there is no uh, you know conspiracy or anything behind this. Uh, there, I actually verified it again this morning with the team, and it is actually just a minor bug. It was not intentional at all. So the Citrix logo will be back here shortly. Next screen. The other big thing uh, around the UI is the reboot screen. It actually matches the login screen now. It, before it used to be the little the the blue background with the grid type color. It was kind of a throwback to the old days. It didn't quite match the login screen, but now the uh, login and the reboot screens match uh, pretty much identically. Next screen. So there's um, a couple of new. Uh, licensing objects at the bottom if you are fully licensed on Platinum on the Netscaler, um, URL filtering and video compression. URL filtering um, is currently not available. It's meant to be part of uh, Secure Web Gateway and it's coming out in the UI um, in feature release one, which is hopefully going to be dropping at the end of June. The video optim optimization is um, for Telco. There's a bunch of really good documentation out there and there's a link up on the uh, slide here which you'll all get post this um, post the webinar and it will explain how that feature is um, benefiting the telco market. 
so this is a new um, GSLV wizard. It fits quite um, well with how Dan was talking about GSLV. Um, it's a it's a really big improvement for people that don't know GSLV inside out and maybe aren't comfortable with the concepts and how it all works. Um, when you when you click on the GSLV node, it will give you the option to fire off a wizard. Once you get started at the top of the screen there, you can see the prerequisites. So it will give you a good list of everything you need in play prior to running the wizard. Um, so you can make sure you've got all this ready before you run through um, setting up your GSLB. Once you, once you put all your details in, it will um, fill out your site services and vServers as well as all your domain bindings and the failover method you need. Um, currently supported in the wizard, you've got you you have you do have the option set up an active active site. You can also do active passive, and there is also the um, availability to do a parent child topology for GSLV. I do think this is this is a good thing. There's a a bunch of um, blog posts that have gone out about this already, and it's, it's quite a prominent feature of the 12 that I release. Citrix are investing a bit of time writing some blogs on it, and it's hopefully going to simplify the, the GSLV setup process for people that don't necessarily know it inside out um, and are comfortable with using a wizard driven approach to that. There are a few um, issues when using the wizard. You should make sure that you've got everything in place prior to running it, because if the wizard crashes out, it may cause problems with your Netscape, we'll, we'll get to that later on. Okay, so we have some new system settings actually. Uh, there's around CPU control and cloud. So first you'll see the configure extra management CPU. Uh, this is not actually for VPXs. Uh, and then on the right hand side we can actually configure uh, VPX specific configuration settings which is around yield and so on. Um, these use cases haven't been written up uh, to my knowledge, but uh, I know there is something in the works around that uh, showing like when you should use these features. Additionally, at the bottom there's the option for configure cloud parameters. Um, this is also not quite written up on yet because it is a newer feature, um, but we will um, get more information around the FQD and the instance and customer ID options and what they're going to be used for um, shortly. Next screen. Yep. Um, so we have the uh, responsive RF web UI login page. Finally, I know a lot of people have been waiting for this. Um, so one thing to note, if you're using an RF web UI based theme right now and you already have a custom logo in there, it will work on the web just fine, but when you bring it up on a mobile device, like in this example, an iPhone, it's going to actually show the default RF Web UI logo, the Netscaler with Unify Gateway logo. Um, for me, uh, the, the way I got it to actually work and show my custom logo is by going into the RF Web UI and creating a child theme, so basically another theme off the default theme. I uploaded my logo and then both web and mobile would work at the same time. I believe it is some kind of caching issue, uh, but this kind of cleared that out. Uh, I didn't investigate it uh, too thoroughly, but uh, this is the workaround uh, to, to get that to actually display on mobile devices if you do come across that issue. Uh, the next big thing that you'll notice is under system auditing, uh, ULFD has been renamed as Logstream. And Logstream is now what's called a beta feature. Basically, it's another way to get uh, app flow data to uh, the Netscaler mass appliances. It is a transport mechanism for AppFlow. So AppFlow by default uses what's called IP fix. Well, now uh, when you're actually configuring your AppFlow settings, you can choose to use Logstream. Logstream is a little bit more scalable. It's a little bit more robust from, from what I've been reading and from some of the features that are actually using this now. Um, you, it is not going to replace uh, IP fix or AppFlow as, um, as uh, uh, that particular transport mechanism as uh, as even though that it is a little bit more robust, it's not going to actually replace it. So you actually have the option to choose uh, either one. What I do expect to see is a lot of people will start migrating to Logstream, and then eventually, uh, you know, at that point, we will have to decide uh, if we if it's going to be kept or not. Um, but right now, you can see that IPFix is it, 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 it supports every module, and Logstream now supports every module as well. Uh, it is not something that we can recommend uh, you do in production just yet. It's something you should really test, but it, because again, this is a uh, beta feature, and there are more uh, more there's more information around this feature um, down at the link below. Uh, next slide. 
And within actual the actual AppFlow settings, you'll actually see some new uh, checkboxes there: uh, video insights, subscriber ID, obfuscation, and HTTP query segment, along with the URL. These are more for uh, the subscriber, the telcos. Uh, you will actually see uh, in Netscaler Mass there's uh, a new section in there uh, under Insight for video specifically, and that's what uh, Dave was uh, alluding to a little bit earlier with uh, uh, some of the video and the optimization around that. Next. So the, um, in the UI for authentication, the authentication policies have now been broken down into um, basic and advanced. Basic policies have kind of um, been referred to as almost like a legacy way of doing authentication. And most of this new stuff going into Netscaler is going into the advanced authentication. Um, an example of this was a bug with RF Web UI and a basic SAML auth policy, and it wasn't um, redirect into the SAML provider properly. The way to get around that was to use n-factor and n-factor authentication to then pass you on to SAML. Um, so they're, they're now split into two different containers. And also the advanced policies have got the actions now grouped in with that rather than in the basic authentication. Possibly something that's going to happen in the future around basic authentication maybe phasing that method out or not. Okay, when you're actually creating an authentication policy, you'll notice there's a new action type called EPA, which is an endpoint analysis. When you actually go ahead and create uh, one of those action types, you'll see the screen to the right-hand side uh, where you have the default group, quarantine group, kill process, delete files, and you can actually specify your expression there. So uh, this is kind of cool. This is a, a new thing that you can use with authentication policies. Uh, next slide. The uh, Microsoft EMS Intune integration with Netscaler Gateway. So if you go to your Netscaler Gateway virtual servers, right along the top, you'll see a grayed out button called Microsoft EMS Intune integration. When you right click on one of those V servers, though, you'll actually have the ability to turn this on or rever revert the configuration. If you do choose to do this integration and click on that button, you'll get the next screen, which is the, uh, the wizard. Uh, right here, so it's going to actually talk about the prereqs along the top, and at the bottom you can put in your client ID, client secret, tenant ID, and the audience to help you uh, configure this piece. The other big uh, news on 12.0 is around VMware View and PCOIP proxy support. Um, traditionally, with NetScaler Gateway, we were always talking about SSL ICA proxy, right? So specifically around HDX traffic. Uh, then Netscaler Unified Gateway, that's a combination of SSL IC proxy plus SSL VPN and CVPN. And those were kind of the ways into your environment. They really focused around uh, Citrix, uh, Citrix backend, right? So last year, the team came out with what's called RDP proxy, where you don't really need to have the backend uh, HDX type infrastructure. You can just use regular RDP to get in and use your uh, Netscaler Gateway as kind of a an aggregation point. Um, now the team has introduced what's called PCOIP proxy uh, which is used for VMware View. So if you are running a View environment or you're running View plus and desktop, which I know some people are, uh, you can now use that Netscaler uh, again as that aggregation point for uh, every type of access into your environment. Uh, it's a simple little tab now in, in your in your uh, session profiles under PCOIP. You create the profile there. Uh, on the right hand side you can actually see the the connection URL and the session timeout and create it in there. Next. Uh, the other big news is uh, SDX now uh, actually allows more than six cores per VPX instance. Now, this uh, this actually works with the latest version 11.1 as well as 12.0. Uh, I do want to note that you can go up to 10 cores or 16 cores, but it is on the higher end of 40G appliances. So if you have like a regular 14,000 series SDX or uh, you know one of the 10G appliances, then you're not really uh, you're, you're you're still limited. Um, um, so you don't get the 10 cores or the 16 cores. Uh, you have to upgrade to those higher end appliances to, do, to use this. This really does help a lot with AppFlow processing. Um, AppFlow takes a lot of cores. It's a lot of data that the Netscaler has to crunch. Um, for some of those use cases where you really, really heavily depended on insight type data, I have seen people 
uh, instead of using SDXs, they would use MPXs, really big, beefy MPXs on the perimeter, uh, just to grab that tor that sort of data. Now um, you actually have the option to use this SDX with a with an uh, with a beefier 40G appliance and be able to unlock these cores and use it for app flow processing. Uh, there is more information on this. Uh, Marissa posted a really good article on this on the Citrix blogs. You can read about it there. Um, and yeah, next slide. So this is, um, this is a, a smaller smaller update, but it's pretty useful. There's a new um, SNMP OID for persistent sessions across vServers. What it allows you to do is get the status of all current persistent sessions across all or any of your V servers that are defined on the Netscaler. It'd be good for your monitoring teams if they want to know the amount of numbers of users on the servers and split them out. Another update, which has been a long time coming, is pack file support. A lot of the enterprise customers use a, a proxy auto config for the outbound proxy internally. And they use that to do the load balancing for their proxy and detection of the closest one. Netscaler, the session profile will now allow you to configure your pack file within your proxy in the client settings on the um, session profile and apply that. And that will update the IE config at init, uh, initialization. initialization excuse me. So this is something. Um, that Jason and I saw and were fairly excited about. Um, so, Atomacy in the Wizards. What what this is meant to do, as you can see at the bottom there, it it removes the residual configuration left by an unsuccessful configuration attempt in, when you're using a wizard. So this means when you're using the Zen Mobile, the Unified Gateway, the Net Netscaler Gateway, or the GSLV wizard, you run through it. It fails to to build the config. In the past, it saved a lot of that to the, say, config of the Netscaler and you reboot it, or you had to snapshot a VPX and revert to get get rid of that data that's gone down to your NSCOM from the wizard. So this is going to roll that back and remove it. Um, Jason and I did a bit of testing on this this morning. We've had very little success with it currently, which is why I mentioned earlier that if you are running the GSLV wizard to set things up, and just make sure you've got all the information needed. The wizards work great. We tried um, adding a uh, unified gateway with the same IP address as an existing server that I already had configured on the Netscaler, as you can see on the left there. And then on the right, all of those V servers were live prior to running that. And then when we when we cancelled that wizard, it brought down a lot of the um, SSLV servers. So this is something we'll be picking up in the Slack channel with the with the Netscaler team. All right. Um, so next up is the HTTP strict transport security. So for those of you that are familiar with uh, the Qualys uh, SSL lab scans and trying to get an A-plus rating, one of the things you had to do was pretty much create a rewrite policy to be able to handle strict transport security. Well, now it's actually in the vServers themselves. So on the left-hand side of the screen, when you go down to SSL parameters, there's a little checkbox called HSTS. Um, I wish they would put it in parentheses, uh, strict transport security, but that is what it is. Uh, go ahead and check that, and you can set the max age there. Additionally, if you're using SSL profiles, you can just go to your default SSL profile, the front end or the back end ones that come on your Netscaler, and you can set the HSTS there and set your max age there. That way, you only have to do it in one place, and you can apply that profile uh, across uh, your Netscaler, and that way you don't have to keep remembering to um, set that. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about is the new product documentation. So um, last year when uh, Krill kind of took over um, for Mark, he had a really big um, um, point around documentation. He 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 really wanted uh, he he heard what customers were saying and really wanted to uh, improve this. So recently, uh, the 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 documentation team, the Edocs team, have released this new platform. Uh, I think it came, became live just a few days ago. I, I don't remember know exactly when, but it was pretty recent. But you'll see that the Netscaler 12 documentation is in there, and it's a lot snappier. It's a lot cleaner looking. Uh, you have the ability to generate PDFs and so on from the documentation uh, itself, from the pages itself, um, and it's it's actually really looking good. Uh, you will see like pictures and diagrams and stuff actually be put into the uh, 
the actual documentation pages. At the bottom of each and every one of those pages, you'll see uh, a, a little a button that says, was this helpful? And you can actually give feedback directly to the team. Um, every time you click on one of these, like if you notice that the documentation is, is uh, missing something or there's misspellings or something's wrong or you feel like it, it needs to be expanded on, you can actually give them feedback directly from here. What it does on the back end for the team that manages this, uh, it actually creates a ticket for them. And so it's actually fully trackable um, by Citrix. And they actually are looking very aggressively at this stuff and actually making changes. Um, just, to, just to talk about it, um, there was a, a CTP, I believe it was Carl Webster, I, I don't remember who it was. Was, um, but he put in a feedback item and within like 10 minutes he actually got a phone call from a manager at Citrix to actually discuss what he was talking about. So they are uh, really paying attention to feedback on product documentation. Again, uh, really take advantage of that uh, the option down there to give uh, the team your feedback. Uh, next screen. Um, so one of the questions that uh, may get asked is what MPX and SDX hardware can 12.0 run on? Um, well, Citrix actually has a really good article here. It's a CTX article with a matrix that actually shows all the different platforms. So you'll actually see all the current platforms as well as a lot of the end of sale platforms toward the bottom. And you'll see on the right hand side, pretty much all of them uh, support 12.0. Um, toward the bottom of this article, there's actually a different um, link for SDX. And when you click on that link, it currently goes to uh, uh, an 11.1 uh, page, but I believe they're going to be updating it really soon to actually show the 12.0 uh, matrix. Um, if you really think about it, MPS and, FPX and SDX are pretty much the same hardware, right? So if you see it in there uh, being supported on, it, on the MPX, then more than likely the SDX is fully supported as well. But it just kind of goes to show that uh, you know, Netscaler truly is a software product. Uh, it doesn't matter you know, how old your hardware really is, uh, it's going to run. Um, next slide. And one other thing to note, uh, 12.0 can actually run on Nutanix Acropolis Hypervisor. It's not on the official data sheet or documents or on the, on the Citrix website yet, um, but Renee Vigler from the community actually wrote uh, about uh, running 12.0 on 4116. You can see a link to that blog there. Uh, additionally, Case Vagerman, who's uh, one of our CTPs, he wrote about how to do this in 2015. So you can actually do this with not only 12.0, but any of the older versions of EPX as well. And lastly, uh, Nutanix actually has a website dedicated to uh, running VPX on uh, AHV. Um, I see a lot more AHV out there than, than before. Uh, it is really growing, and a lot of people like to put Zen App and Zen Desktop workloads on it. And so the next question, next natural question is, can we stick our VPXs on there? So the answer is yes. It's, it's very straightforward. You're just using the KVM uh, image. It's, you're not, it's not the Hyper-V or ESXi image that you download. It's the KVM image you use to actually put it on AHV. Next slide. Um, Netscaler and native OTP, one-time password. So this is actually not a feature in 4116. So the current 12.0 build that you go and download from Citrix.com has no mention of this. But if, you, if you're going to Synergy and you've looked at the session catalog, you'll notice there's a lab that actually discusses this. And uh, Stan and Deleep are actually doing this particular lab and they actually talk about using one-time password natively with Netscaler Unified Gateway. This means you don't have to do like a third-party integration. You don't have to go and find uh, another solution to integrate. Uh, pretty much overnight, uh, this, you, you can make your environment more secure uh, by using this one-time password option. So uh, you, it's, it's gonna be happening on May 22nd uh, at Synergy. Uh, it's gonna be one of the labs. So if you do have time, please do uh, go and sign up for this uh, before the lab actually does fill up. Uh, next one. So moving on to Netscaler um, MAS 12.0. Um, the firmware is obviously came out the same day, April 25th uh, this year. It's got 41 new features, which is slightly less than the, the Netscaler ADC firmware. It's got 15 known issues with the current release. Um, they've also done a lot of work on the UI for for the MAS. It's um, from what we can see, they're trying to match the NMAS UI and the Netscaler UI. So a lot of the bars that used to run along the top have been moved to the side. They've removed a lot of white space and tried to neaten up the um, interface you've got. We're going to run some run through some of the features on this. 
So when you when you first log on, they've got a new um, application layout. It's changed quite a lot from the 11.1 version of uh, Nmans. So there's a new wizard on first deployment, which will walk you through what the new app dashboard is and what it can do. It's quite useful. It's also worth having a look at if um, if you're not used to it or if you've not used any of the uh, higher builds. As I said earlier, that there are quite a few UI changes to Nmaz. Uh, initially, it's quite difficult to get your head around how it how it's all laid out and how it's working. But once once you get out of the mindset of using the traditional Nmaz interface, it's actually very similar to how you would navigate a Netscaler. So things you kind of look for things in the same place. It's got a new um, hamburger menu in the in the top left corner. Which will um, expand the menu you can see there on the on the right hand side of the screen. One thing worth noting in that menu is that the uh, infrastructure option has gone. That's that's actually been renamed now to networks. So everything you used to you know, when you deploy Nmaz, the first thing you do is add a Netscaler. You would normally look for the infrastructure tab. You want to be looking under the networks now for that. Um, They've improved the SSL dashboard and just given you more relevant information nearer the top and just improved the look and feel of it a bit. It's, um, the one on the top right there is the, the old uh, SSL dashboard you get. It is incredibly useful for keeping a track of your networking and state SSL certs across your net scalers. It kind of stops you getting caught out by expiries. Um, the one on the bottom left there, you can see they've They've put descriptive methods in for um, more detail on cert expiry. And on the right, um, if your SSL v servers aren't using uh, Diffie-Hellman keys or the, the protocol listings are off, then it will list them right up near the top of the SSL dashboard screen. So you can see straight away what your estate's looking like out there from a, from a certificate point of view. All right, next up is configuration, uh, uh, the master configuration actually for configuration jobs. Um, what this allows you to do now is um, take a master configuration, uh, put in a template in there with your with the settings that you want, and then actually use variables to uh, in input your customizations and then deploy that to another Netscaler. So if you really think about it, if you're running SDXs and you've got a ton of VPX instances, if you wanted to make one change, uh, it's pretty ridiculous to be able to have to log into each one of those uh, GUIs and actually make your change. It's very easy to make a mistake. It, it's, it takes up a lot of time. So there are things like Nitro and PowerShell. If you've seen Esther uh, do her webinars, it's amazing what you can do with automation around Netscaler. Um, so one of the things that Mass has built in is this thing called configuration jobs that will actually allow you to build out configs and then deploy to multiple Netscalers. Uh, and it just makes it a lot easier to manage uh, larger Netscaler environments. Even if you have just, you know, two SDXs um, and you just have like maybe, you know, five VPX instances per, you know, a pretty small environment, uh, really, um, this actually will help you uh, a ton. So this is something that I get asked about a lot. Uh, this is probably going to become one of my favorite features of Netscaler Mass because it just brings so much value uh, to be able to manage your Netscalers this way. Um, next slide. Uh, the other big thing uh, with 12.0 is that more you have more granular access. Uh, so before you could actually use, you could tie your Mass logins into Active Directory and log in with Active Directory credentials, but now you can actually um, choose kind of like how you do on a Netscaler, like what modules within uh, the appliance the users could have access to. So let's say that I have some web developers and I just want them to be able to manage load balancing only. I don't mind them managing everything I have in load balancing. Well, if that's the case, I create a group just for that, give them access to just that, and um, that's all they'll have when they log in. They won't see all the other stuff in the left-hand pane. Next slide. So uh, Stylebooks. So you'll see more and more Stylebooks released over time. Stylebooks is actually the replacement for App Expert templates. You, you'll notice App Expert templates haven't been updated in a very long time. That's because the team has been working really hard on these Stylebooks. With this release of Mass, you actually have a new SharePoint 2016 Stylebook. Um, and what's really cool about this, if you if you read the release notes too and actually click through it, um, you have the ability to 
uh, specify different NetScaler instances for different roles within the stylebook. So let's say, for example, you have uh, like a three-tier application and you've got database, uh, you're, you're front-ending your databases with NetScaler, right? And that's on a separate set of instances. And then you're doing authentication, like a central authentication set of instances. And then you're doing web front-ends or something with, uh, with another set of instances. Um, so these totally different instances can all be kind of tied together using the stylebook. Go ahead and next. And then the other big thing uh, around uh, MASS is what's called pooled licensing. So it gives MASS the ability to check in and check out licenses to the VPXs or really uh, whatever's actually connecting to them. You'll notice that in the uh, instances you'll, you'll see um, the ability to use what's called remote licensing and you select the pooled licensing mode and then you point it at MASS and then mass, uh, when you go into the networks tab, you'll see all the different instances that you've loaded uh, or licenses you've loaded up on mass and it'll actually check it out. Um, basically, what you have to do is reallocate all your licenses though. It, you don't, typically most people have it right now allocated to um, the appliances. Now you're allocating it uh, to mass and then mass is the one that hands it out. Um, think of, it's, it's not, it doesn't really have anything to do with TriScale, but I like to, uh, have a or make a correlation at Triscale. Triscale is what really makes NetScalers really flexible, right? And now with this new pooled licensing concept, it makes it it makes your investment a lot more flexible. Um, you can see here in the screenshot, we've got a VPX 200, a 1000, and a VPX 3000 license, and you can you can you you can load as many licenses as you want, and they get checked out uh, to the instances that need them. Um, next slide. So. Um, there's two new event rule actions um, that are available within within the networking tab. So, like clearly, NMAS can monitor pretty much anything you're, that's happening on your Netscalers, and it can send an event back to MAS to deal with. Um, one of the things in 11.1 .1 is you could send an email or a trap action or an SMS out, so you'd you'd get mail notifications um, when, when something was happening. But there was no real option in NMAS to self-heal um, the problem. So the two new options uh, you've got now are run a command action or execute a job. So what you could essentially do um, is build a config job on the NMAS um, configuration job editor, put all your parameters against that, save that as a template and execute that in the event of a um, failure or an alert happening on your NMAS appliance. The other thing you can do is run a command. So if, if something goes wrong and you need to you need to rerun the command to bring it back online, you can execute that now directly from NMAS without needing to um, integrate any any kind of third party email triggered platform. There's a new app uh, dashboard for activity monitoring. Um, this is one of the reasons that Wizards there when you first deploy NMAS is it, it's clearly changed a lot from from how it used to look. You've got this sort of tree map or tiles which sort of mirrors the Windows 10 sort of start menu. On the right there it will give you a bunch of information around um, your total uh, applications that are defined. You can um, define custom applications in here that can consist of more than one load balance fee server. So if you have a three or four tier application, you can wrap all of them up into a, a custom app in the same way that you could do on eleven one, but it will display all the all the information front and center here right on the app dashboard. Okay, next up is the server response anomaly screen. Uh, so uh, there's quite a few dashboards that are supposed to be coming out with 12 and available to you. Um, but not everything is quite there yet. I think a lot of it's being uh, held back for the uh, FP1 release. Uh, as Dave mentioned, it's probably going to coordinate with the Netscaler release toward the end of June. Um, but this is kind of what advanced analytics is all about. This is what gives you the ability to flag certain, or allow mass to flag certain issues that it sees with those little red dots, and then you can actually drill down into it. In this case, uh, server response time anomaly. Um, 
advanced analytics, uh, the, there it, it does take quite a bit of data. There, there was a sizing guide that was released to the partners. It hasn't been made public to the customers just yet. Uh, it's not an e-docs yet uh, because they're still writing that documentation out. Um, but um, there are there have been some sizing guidelines around mass, and um, it actually breaks down what each portion uh, of mass. Uh, requires for a specific number of vServers and specific VP instances and advanced analytics does take quite a bit of storage space um, these uh, so you do have to have some considerations around that otherwise you can have potentially your, your mass appliance fill up um, so um, we, uh, we we did not actually test this feature out fully um, because I believe it requires a telemetry server to be set up and uh, we, we're, we're, st we'll, we're still going through all the different features right now um, but so this particular screenshot is actually from the uh, the marketing slide uh, that we had, um, but it kind of just shows you what some of the capabilities are. Uh, we will have more information uh, on this on an upcoming webinar, and uh, there I believe um, Carl Stallhood actually uh, released some of his documentation uh, around uh, uh, 12.0 mass, so you can actually read a little bit more on that and telemetry servers and seeing how it all is configured. Um, next slide. So one thing that I want to talk about is Netscaler Mass Service. This is a, uh, um, a service that is actually coming to Citrus Cloud pretty soon. Um, so think about all the overhead I just talked about on on-prem deployments, especially around storage. Um, this data has to go somewhere, right? And you're going to your data center teams and saying, hey, I need this much storage um, you know, for my appliances. And if you have net scalers all over the place, uh, then uh, in different data centers around the world, then that means you're going to have to have potentially mass appliances at each location. That's a lot of storage, right? So instead of you taking on this overhead, why don't you make it Citrus's problem? So uh, that's what mass service is all about, in my opinion. It's about uh, being able to um, take a lot of the uh, management overhead uh, and just not have to deal with it. Just be able to use the product, concentrate on building out your applications and doing what you really want to do is to really analyze that data. Um, this is really cool, I think, because you have with you know hybrid and multi-cloud management, um, you, you can actually do on-prem and cloud-based Netscaler. So, um, and it doesn't matter where your Netscalers are. Think about you know if you have if you're if you've got Netscalers in Azure or AWS or on-prem, it's a combination of all of them. There's not a whole lot of information on the mass service yet. Uh, I have a lot of questions around it uh, personally. Um, think about like. Uh, right now, today, with um, AppFlow data and Netscaler, there are latency considerations between where your Netscaler sits and where the mass appliance sits. So I'm really curious to see how this mass service is going to come out. Uh, I'm really looking forward to some additional information and documentation on this when it is available. But it is something to just keep in mind um, You know uh, that this is going to be coming soon. Next slide. Um, so we did see uh, some, we, we, we are aware of some known issues and some, we have some workarounds for these. So upgrading to 12.0 uh, via the GUI might actually fail for some people. It uh, actually failed on me once. And um, what I ended up doing, uh, what, what I saw was that you upload the firmware and it just sits there. It doesn't actually initiate the upgrade. And you're just kind of sitting there staring at it. It does nothing. So you have to kind of, uh, you know, uh, putty in and then you have to kick off the upgrade manually. <laughs> Um, and it, it it works fine after that. So um, one of the that that's one workaround. One of the things that we saw in the release notes is actually that uh, the install ns-c to do the cleanup is no longer available. It's been deprecated in 12.0. So the workaround right now is to actually clean up the flash storage on the device. So make sure when you uh, before you upgrade your Netscaler, make sure you have um, uh, enough space to be able to do this. Um, next slide. So there's another um, another documented known issue, and it's a uh, memory leak with SSL VPN connections. So what they say is that the, it's gra gradually going to diminish the amount of memory available for SSL VPNs, and then eventually your Netscaler is going to become unworkable. It's going to fail unless you reboot it. Um, so obviously, if you're running 12.0 in production or or in a, in a critical place, you need to be able to monitor the memory utilization on the Netscaler appliance until this is patched. You could use NMAS to monitor that and initiate a failover to a, to a HA partner. 
and then restart, but just it's worth being aware that if you do see the memory creeping up on your 12 hour Netscalers and you've got a lot of SSL VPN connections going through, then it's worth um, keeping an eye out for this one. Uh, the next issue uh, that's a known issue is that IE8 won't show the gateway page with some themes, and those are you know X1 Green Bubble default and so on. It only seems to work with RF Web UI. Um, so the workaround for you is well, number one, hopefully you're not using IE8 internally, um, <laughs> but um, it's really more around the external parties that that uh, I'd be more worried about because you never can control what they're running, right? So. You know they're going to try and get use IE8 to get to your gateway, and if it doesn't load, they're going to call your service desk. So one of the workarounds that I would suggest you do is use a responder policy, check for IE8 coming across, and as soon as you see that, just go ahead and, and redirect them to a maintenance page. And you can use the Netscaler itself to host those maintenance pages using the HTML page imports feature. So I would just put like a, just a quick little page on there that says, hey, you're using a browser that's not supported. Please use a different browser or um, you know, contact the service desk or whatever it is that you need to do. But this, this can help elim eliminate a lot of the confusion around this if you do notice you have IE8 users using your uh, gateway. So just moving on finally to some stuff that's going on at Synergy this year, if you're, if you're over there. Um, there are... Uh, nine instructor-led networking labs, so they, there's nine separate labs that uh, have a networking twist on them. It's well worth attending one of them if you're over there and you want to learn some stuff around Netscaler and NMAS and everything networking. There are 23 individual networking breakout sessions of which uh, three are by CTPs. Um, there are seven networking hot topic roundtable roundtable sessions, some led by uh, SIG members and others by CTPs. Got to um, just mention our fellow SIG leaders, uh, Hot Topic, um, sorry, his uh, breakout session. He, he did have a fireside chat on access and authentication options in the Citrix environment, and that's since been upgraded to a breakout session. So if um, you are over at Synergy, be sure to check out Maris's session it's, is no doubt going to be very good. Um, there's also three networking uh, fireside chats, and at least one of them is led by a SIG member. And the next thing we want to point out is that uh, Boss, one of our CTPs, actually uh, wrote an, a great little article on um, a lot of the CTP-led sessions, all, all the CTP-led se sessions at Synergy this year. Um, so uh, typically, um, uh, CTP sessions and before I was even a CTP um, I always found that they were really really in-depth and really just kind of said you know just kind of laid it out like it is right so it's not the typical sales pitch or anything like that or just going over product overview it's like actual information that is going out in the real world so definitely if you're going to Synergy uh, take a look at Boss's article to pick out a few of these sessions that you want and make sure that you sign up for them um, before you head out to Synergy And with that, uh, that is the end of our presentation on 12.0 for Netscaler and Netscaler Mass. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, actually, there's quite a few questions. Yes. Um, <clears throat> we have got a question about uh, success on PC over IP. Uh, well, I, I personally have not tested it myself because I don't have a view environment. I know that uh, I, I know that uh, I was talking to actually at, at another CTP about this. Um, there, there's some testing going on, but it's um, the documentation is in the process of getting updated. There's a lot of stuff going on around it, um, but personally, no, I have not uh, tested the feature out. Okay, another question about uh, Netscaler Mass. Um, can I get reports of SSL VPN users? 
Uh, yes, uh, with the Gateway Insight feature, um, that's basically everybody that's coming in with SSL VPN. You're going to be able to see all those users there. You're going to be able to see quite a bit of information uh, around authentication and endpoint analysis. Um, th this has been a, there for a while now, so even if you're not running 12.0, um, you can use this with older versions of MASS. Okay, and another one about NetSkill MASS. Uh, it seems that we have that we cannot configure email alerts from collecting this log events. For example, we cannot we can collect a this log event for triple A log and fail, uh, but we cannot configure an email alert for it. Um, do you know if there are some email alerts for such events? I've not actually looked at. Um that specifically, I know there's there's a bunch of stuff you can configure as system events to to create event items within NMAS and then trigger a rule based on that. I would need to look at that. That I can put some details around that on um, on the blog post that we we're clearly going to have to do. There's I can, looking at the questions. There's quite a few there, and I realise we're quite close to or actually overrunning. I do see a question in there around pooled licensing. Does this require reboot of the NetScaler appliance when a license is allocated? Dave, do you recall if we had to reboot the appliance? Uh, I th think we did, didn't we? To actually get the license to kick in? I think so, yeah. I think so too. I think yeah. So. Yeah, it's depending on the NetScaler so, because the NetScaler licensing service will only start once uh, when you start up the NetScaler. So, yes, you have to yeah. reboot it. And it's not like you can change the licensing model on the fly. Yeah, right. And Esther's asking, so, is there a special networking uh, drink uh, scheduled like last year? Um, basically, there was like a little reception for networking last year. Um, I don't believe there is one this year, but I do know there's a navigator's reception. Uh, I think on the first day of Synergy, um, you have to, I, I don't remember the schedule off the top of my head. Um, there are also some very specific industry focused ones and there is one for healthcare uh, on the last day, Thursday, right before the final night party. Um, so definitely check out the, the schedule, not the session catalog on CitrixSynergy.com, but the actual schedule there. It will actually lay all these out. There's also the um, CEGC pregame drinks that a lot of people will be attending. Right, I think we have got one last question. Um, did they finally fix the licensing issue around only using command center piece in Nenmask? So reading the um, reading the posts and the release notes and stuff on it, it, you can you can monitor all of your Netscalers natively, but you only if you want analytics on the V servers, you need you get thirty free V servers out of the box, and then you can buy packs of licensing over and above that. So from what I've read, yes, I've not not tested it personally. Yeah, I mean, I've seen like S a syslog, SNMP, I mean, all that stuff is is unlimited, right? It's just when you want to get the inside data, the real hardcore analytics, that's where, you know, you you have to pay attention to your uh, vServer account. Um, and like Dave said, you get 30 for free, and then anything over that, it's 100-pack bundles that you would buy. So um, you would buy them at 100-pack, 100 100-packs. 100 no, you can't buy like 5 or 10 or anything like that. They're, they come as 100-packs. I think that's it, right? Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. We'll uh, hand it back to Stephanie then. All right. Um, thank you, guys. That was uh, very informative and in-depth, and I uh, hope everybody got a lot out of it. Um, in the chat window, you'll see a few links. I put a link to the forum thread for this webinar. You can ask more questions there, and we'll make sure that everyone sees them. Also put a link to our survey. It's very short and anonymous, and we just love to get your feedback and any comments you have. Um, it helps us plan future webinars. 
And um, finally, the last link in there is how you can find CUGC at Synergy. We have a booth this year in the in the uh, in Synergy Park, excuse me, um, next to the community hub. We'd love for you to stop by. Um, through that link, you can also register for the CUGC pregame reception that Dave mentioned and uh, find out where to pick up t-shirts um, and all kinds of swag. Uh, and then finally, just to remind you that you will get an email tomorrow from GoToWebinar that has a link to the recording of today's presentation as well as to the networking and healthcare SIGs. And I will uh, make sure that everyone gets a copy of all the questions that were asked today and uh, we'll get those answers posted out in the forums for you guys as well in the in both of the SIG forums and uh, also in the thread for this webinar. And with that, I'd like to thank everyone again for attending and thank Dave and Karsten and Dan and Jason for presenting today and uh, hope to see you guys um, here soon on another CUGC webinar. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much.